Hello, and thanks once again for joining me on the Economic Rockstar podcast. Again, I'm going to be doing a rebroadcast of a previous episode that has featured in order to just to keep the consistency going regarding the release of episodes. And I will settle back quite shortly with new guests who I have lined up to feature on the podcast. So for all of you who are dedicated listeners to the show, I do apologize for a re-release of a previous episode, but I did actually find this interview with Professor Diane Coyle extremely interesting, especially given circumstances regarding measurements of our GDP. And she does explain them for all of those people who may not understand what GDP is, who are listening to this, and also allows those seasoned economists who have been teaching GDP or who read it from a newspaper on what's going on with our economy to question, allow them to question, how is this actually measured? Can we actually trust it? And is it a correct measure of economic growth? Diane is a wonderful economist. And when I was invited to speak at a conference in Edinburgh, Part of my discussion was based on my conversation with Diane in this episode. And this episode first featured on the 21st of January 2016 as episode 69. And you can check out all the books, links and resources discussed with Diane over at economicrockstar.com forward slash Diane Coyle. And again, as always, thank you for your support, your ongoing support for pressing play. That means a lot to me. Just continuously press play. Check out the back catalogue. This will give you the opportunity. If you've already listened to this episode, it'll give you a chance to go back and maybe listen to something else that you might have missed out on. Be open-minded, especially if you're strictly on one type of thinking regarding an economic discipline or an economic perspective. And share share this episode with somebody. Go to Spotify or iTunes. Spotify is probably, probably the easiest to share. And, you know, just copy the link and share or share that on social media. You can always check out the website, economicrockstar.com, and there's many ways in which you can share it there. You can actually download the episode, save it onto your phone. If you're not connected to Wi-Fi, you can actually listen away on your phone and delete it when you're done with it. Any other ways in which you can support the show, of course, I'd appreciate it if you left an honest rating or review on iTunes, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, and to subscribe. And for those of you who would like to financially support a podcast for as little as $1 a month, why not check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar. And as always, check out my social media page. I'd love to continue the conversation with you over there too. So you can find me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram or more formally on LinkedIn. So thanks again for listening. Really appreciate it. And Enjoy this episode with Professor Diane Coyle. Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Diane Coyle, Professor of Economics at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Diane is author of GDP, A Brief But Affectionate History, and in our conversation, we go on a deep dive into understanding what is GDP, its difference with GNP, its shortcomings, as well as the complications in measuring the GDP statistic. Diane also explains the history behind GDP as a measure of our economic growth, as well as her views on the Human Development Index and the Gross National Happiness Index. Diane also shares with us her views on the UK's over-reliance on the financial sector, as well as her interpretation of economics being a soulful science rather than a dismal science. You can check out all the show notes and links and books and other resources mentioned in this episode at economicrockstar.com forward slash Diane Coyle, or simply visit the website and in the search bar, type in Diane or the episode number 69. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support.
If you'd like to support the show and become a patron of the Economic Rockstar podcast, please visit patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and in the search bar, type in Economic Rockstar to find out more. It is very complicated. You could add together all the incomes or all the money that people spend or all the output that businesses produce, and they ought to come to the same number, but they don't. And there's such margin of error around the figures. It's just so easy now to download data from the internet and run it through statistical packages and get some results. And I think a lot of professional economists are guilty of not really thinking about their data enough. I think there's also a real set of issues about top incomes and the way that a sort of global plutocracy has been able to use globalization and the financial markets and executive salaries to enrich themselves. Is there so much inequality that a country is going to become ungovernable? You look at the United States and you think, well, maybe, yes, that can happen uh, because it's so polarised and, and, um, and dysfunctional politically now. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar podcast. I am so honoured to have Diane Coyle join me today. Hi, Diane. Welcome to the show. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks very much. Diane Coyle is Professor of Economics at the University of Manchester and runs the consultancy Enlightenment Economics. Diane is Vice Chair of the BBC Trust and was a member of the Migration Advisory Committee and a member of the Competition Commission. She is also a visiting research associate at the University of of Oxford's Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Diane specialises in competition analysis and the economics of new technologies and globalisation. Diane is the author of several books including GDP, A Brief but Affectionate History, The Economics of Enough, The Soulful Science, Sex, Drugs and Economics and The Paradoxes of Prosperity. She was previously economics editor of The Independent and before that worked at the Treasury and in the private sector as an economist. Diane has a PhD from Harvard and was awarded the OBE in January 2009. Diane, your work is quite specialised but yet varied within the area of economics. And I'd love to touch on one of your latest books, if you don't mind. Yes, go, go ahead. And I'd love to talk a bit more about GDP because as you're well aware and many of our listeners are well aware of the occurrences that happened since 2007, And if they're interested in the history of economics, we see GDP plays a vital role in determining how our economies perform. But I suppose I'd start off with a simple question. What is GDP and how is it measured? The simple answer to the simple question is that it is the total of all the activity, marketed economic activity, the things that that money is spent on in the economy. And once you've stated the simple answer, you then have to go into the complications about it, because it's actually a very complicated entity. One of the complications is that there are some marketed bits of the economy that are going in there and have been for about a year now that are illegal. So in the past year, the definition has changed to include, um, for example, illegal drugs deals. And that's the first indication that actually... This isn't a natural object. It's not um, something like measuring the height of a mountain or the speed of light. It's not anything in the natural world. It's a man-made object. Another complication is that some bits of the economy that we count in GDP actually aren't in the market, and we don't pay money for them directly. We do it indirectly, and that's all of government spending. So it's uh, something whose definition has been debated, changed many times over the decades since it was first created in the Second World War. And the idea that we have something called the economy that you can measure in that way only dates back as far as the 1930s and 1940s. It's the creature of the Great Depression, when for the first time governments felt they'd better get an idea of what the economy as a whole was doing because voters were starting to demand that they did something about the about the economic crisis then. And then in wartime, there was a need to know what the capacity of the economy was to produce the the goods that were needed to to fight the war successfully. And that led to the entity that we have now, 
Um, its definition has changed. It's really complicated to to measure it because you have to find out all the basic information. And statisticians survey businesses, they survey individuals, they go around shops and look at what the prices are. They um, get information from farmers. They have all the different activities in the economy to add together, to put in the same monetary terms and to calculate a price index for so that you can determine what, what part of it is just inflation and what part of it is real growth that will create that will create jobs. So it's actually, although we use it every day and it sounds really simple, and you asked a very simple question to which I'm giving a very long answer, it's actually a really complicated thing. And it's quite complex because even studying it as a student with the no- multiple measures of how to calculate GDP, it's actually quite, personally, when I first came across it, quite confusing. And even to try and visualise those people going out collecting price information, it seems so orthodox or traditional or somewhat... Well, it's not, a bit old-fashioned. Old yeah, I was just, I wanted to use that word old-fashioned or something different, but yeah, old-fashioned. There, there's a move now to um, modernise the way the statistics are collected, and we have in the UK a review being undertaken by Sir Charles Bean, and one of its recommendations will be about using um, more modern methods, what, what are called administrative data and big data, to try and collect some of the figures. And But as, as you say, it is very complicated. You could add together all the incomes or all the money that people spend, or all the output that businesses produce, and they ought to come to the same number, but they don't. And there's such a margin of error around the figures. It really makes me very anxious. When we, each quarter when the numbers come out, we obsess about whether it's 0.2 or 0.3, and what does that mean, and politicians think they have to respond to what, what, what those numbers are. And actually, there's just a huge margin of error. There's just great uncertainty about it. You know, another worry is that countries like Ireland or like Greece have been told uh, you must cut spending on public services because the budget deficit's too big as a proportion of GDP. Well, we can count the budget deficit reasonably well, but actually we can't count GDP at all well. And so really quite important decisions about government fiscal policy and about monetary policy and interest rates are being made on the basis of a number that I think people are taking much too seriously. And we just need to remind ourselves about the huge uncertainties about it. You're at the forefront through your website, Enlightenment Economics, and also by the publication of this book, GDP, A Brief But Affectionate History. You're at the forefront of bringing this to our our attention. But as a lecturer at the University of Manchester, how do you approach this based on maybe a principles or an undergrad economics course? Do you follow the textbook definition of GDP or do you elaborate on this in terms of trying to get students to think in terms of not taking the calculated measures too seriously? The students today in all universities, not just mine, are not taught as much about national income accounting as used to be the case in my day, which is a shame. And I think it's partly because it's just so easy now to download data from the internet and run it through statistical packages and get some results. And I think a lot of professional economists are guilty of not really thinking about their data enough. But what I would hope to teach all students is that you can't think about the economy mechanically at all. And I I teach public policy economics and try to teach students to think in terms of first principles about what is the problem that we think the government ought to be doing something about. Why does it require government intervention and couldn't be left to the market or to individuals themselves? So that you'd be clear about what kind of tools then you can bring to bear on public policy problems. And then taking really very carefully what evidence you have and how you evaluate whether you're making things better or not. Because I certainly don't think markets work well all the time. Uh, We need both government and markets. But there is such a tendency for governments, policymakers, advised by economists almost all the time, to be just too prescriptive and not be um, aware enough of the uncertainties in what they're advising, but also in all the other values that matter. It's not just about economic efficiency, it's about other values too. And too often, as professional economists, that, that gets overlooked. You mentioned that it came to prominence in the 1940s, mainly due to a 
identify whether economies are growing or what needs to be done in t- during the world war at that time. But were yes. there any other proxy variables to measure economic activity or productivity before this? And why haven't they been continuously used or was there anything in existence before GDP? People have taken different views about how to what they want to measure and how to do it over time. And the the idea of thinking about an economic arena that you might want to measure dates back to probably the late 17th century and some of the early work. I mean, actually, the figures, the oldest figures of the Doomsday Book back in the 11th century. But but around the start of the Industrial Revolution was when people began to think that there was a domain of business and economics and collect figures. Uh, very often it was about what could you tax to raise revenues to fight wars against the French if you're talking about Britain. And um, as the economy changes, what people want to pay attention to changes as well. Adam Smith was most interested in manufacturers because he was writing at a time when the uh, impact of the Industrial Revolution was, was very clear, and that continued through the 19th century. And then in the early 20th century, unemployment became an issue during the Great Depression. So as the structure of the economy changes, what people want to measure changes as well. And I think that's happening again now because we have this measure GDP that was devised in an age when manufacturing was more important and when manufacturing was mass production and when economies were national and not globalised. And now we have very globalised production systems and economies that are largely services in the rich countries with in, in ta- what's what are called intangibles being very a very important part of that, which means research and development or um, advertising or the creative industries and so on. And I think we're going to need to, at some stage, probably quite soon, have a rethink again about how do we think, what do we mean when we talk about the economy? Because using a measure like GDP that doesn't care about quality, it's really hard to measure quality, it's really hard to measure variety in GDP, and even think about the idea of productivity in the services sector, it's it's very different, and I think it will have to change again. These are the challenges that we as economists are facing, and I don't know if there's any solutions to it immediately, and if there is a solution, do you have any suggestions what they could be? Because I know there are other alternatives to measuring GDP, such as the Human Development Index, well, you started with a very easy question, but now you've asked a very hard question. Okay, <laughs> we'll stick with the easy one first, then. Well, there are lots of there are lots of alternatives already. You mentioned the Human Development Index. Uh, people have calculated figures that look at taking out the depletion of natural resources or, or bad effects on the, on the environment. There are what are called dashboards, and there are quite a few of these around, which means not looking at just one number, but looking at a whole series of numbers, because there are lots of things you care about. So you might want to measure separately growth and employment in the economy, what's happening to the environment, what's happening to um, to financial wealth and other kinds of assets, uh, work-life balance. People want to put all kinds of other indicators in there. And there's also, I just I think, a question about just rethinking what do we mean by productivity in, in the services economy, which is theoretical economics work. And I certainly don't have have the answer to that. That's that's quite difficult. But the way we measure GDP now is really closely linked to Keynesian macroeconomic theory and the very famous definition he gave of what total output in the economy is, that it's consumer spending, government spending, uh, investment spending, and the balance of of payments. And I I think what you measure does tie into that theoretical way that that you think about the economy. So it's early days in that, and I don't have the answer to that for you. There's also an alternative, me- well, not an alternative measure, but we have another measure of productivity, and that's gross national product. And as a student, we were presented with two of these, that Ireland actually had a choice where they could act- manipulate the productivity or the economic growth of the country in order to get, say, funding from the EEC at the time, or the EU. And there could be comparative measures, and one could be higher and one could be lower. And now, I'm not sure if they manipulated the the performance of the economy by what, using one measure over the other. And they definitely wouldn't have been able to deceive the source of the funding. But can economies use one measure over the other for particular reasons, such as getting funding or for particular bailout reasons? Or- they certainly can. Everybody used GNP, gross national product, until 
probably around 1980, and then switched to using gross domestic product. And the difference is just the amount that's earned from activities um, based overseas. For a few countries, there's a big gap, and Ireland's one of the countries for which there is a big gap. For most countries, it's not very big in the scheme of things, and, and it didn't really matter all that much. But I think what you're pointing to is um, what are called administrative uses of the statistics, and it is concerning. For example, I, I started out by saying just last year, a lot of countries added in illegal activities to their GDP definition. And that's great because if you've got a target for your budget deficit in terms of GDP, then the bigger you can make the GDP, the easier it is to hit that target. And it becomes a political football. There's a very good example in Greece when before uh, it's before the entry into the euro, they wanted to increase their GDP figure as much as they could so that they could look like they were going to meet the criteria for membership of the single currency. And they did that by making up the numbers, essentially. And the European statisticians refused to valid validate the numbers, but the entry went ahead on that basis. When the bailout came, the lenders to Greece installed a statistician who could um, produce some much better, some much higher quality figures. And there has been a political battle in Greece ever since about his status and what these numbers ought to be saying. So they are absolutely a political football. And that's the result of putting too much weight on the numbers, ignoring the uncertainty around them. And I think these administrative uses are probably largely inappropriate. But there's kind of, um, what's the word, it's kind of ego game for countries too. A number of African countries in the past couple of years have improved, their updated their calculations and have discovered that they have 60 or 80 percent more GDP than they thought they used to. And of course, it hasn't changed anything in reality. If you live in Nigeria or Ghana and you're poor, you're as poor as you ever were. And the, but the thing is that in these sort of international rankings, it makes Nigeria look a bigger economy and bigger than South Africa now. And those things do have they do have political consequences. And those political consequences could mean a, a ousting of a government. Oh, potentially they could. And there are examples of political consequences over time of GDP figures being reported, or actually other economic statistics, that, that turn out um, not to be the case. They get revised away later. The famous example in the UK is the late 1970s, when Dennis Healy had to call in the International Monetary Fund, partly because it looked like the government budget deficit was a very large proportion of GDP. And as time went by... That, that figure got revised down substantially. And if he'd had the later figure originally, then it might be that Labour would not have lost that election. Mrs Thatcher would not have come to power. The whole economic deregulation and privatisation would not have happened. There'd be an entire alternative history, not just for the UK, but for the rest of the world, actually, because of that being so influential. There's three things I'd like to take us back on which you mentioned before I actually move on. I'll actually mention them because they're, they're so different. And just in case I forget them, one of them is the doomsday book you mentioned, the other one, the illegal activities, and then the HDI again. But if I go back to the illegal activities that governments are trying to include or statisticians are including in the measure of GDP, would this not inflate GDP? And also illegal activities tend to, because of the nature, more than likely are created scarcity and then uh, higher inflation. I know you wrote a blog post on drugs or in one of your books, Sex, Drugs and Economics, and there is a huge price differential between heroin, say, or say uh, cannabis in the Netherlands and the UK, mainly because the Netherlands have legalized the use of cannabis. So their GDP measure will be lowered, even though they may consume higher quantities, possibly. Hmm. Um. It's complexity on complexity. It, it is the case that the illegality of objects creates scarcity and that puts the price up. And there are lots of examples. Prohibition in the United States in the 1930s is one example. And that's why uh, going into the illegal drugs business is very profitable because there's a, a high margin by that sort of government created barrier to entry. You have a, a much more monopoly power than you would in a normal market. And that's part of the case for legalisation. And if you look at the proportions of prison populations that around the world that are the result of people imprisoned because of, of uh, drug illegality, that's part of the case that people make for uh, legalising some of the drugs. And that includes, by the way, senior politicians in Latin America who, who live with us day to day. 
So there is that effect. In terms of counting it in GDP, it's just slightly bizarre, isn't it? Mm. Because on the one hand, we count illegal drugs, we count prostitution, but we don't count caring for children and old people at home. I was just going to say that, yeah, because I had Shosanna Grossberg and she said it should be measured in GDP. In fact, um, in, in the early debates, many economists thought that it should be included in that measure that you were trying to create of economic activity. And the ar- argument was always that it was just too difficult to find out how people were spending their time at home all day. Actually, if you use new technology and big data, that might become much easier now, given how much tracking of their activities people are doing. So it it becomes more feasible. But, I mean, the other thing is, how do they collect the data? You can't imagine statisticians going with their clipboards to the red light district and saying, excuse me, madam, can you tell me how much you charge for your services? It's just all very, very strange. And I can't see, actually, I can see a good case for having the data about the illegal activities because you want to implement policies on them. I can't really see a good case for including it in your measure of how your economy is doing and and holding politicians to account for it. We don't really want them to be, you know, seeing a a huge expansion of illegal activity and boasting about how fast GDP growth is. Because if you have higher levels of GDP based on the inclusion of illegal activities, then it could question the type of economy that you're running, the size of your black market. Indeed. And and, and how well policymakers are, are doing what they're supposed to do, which is creating good conditions of life for all their citizens. And there's a question mark over that then, and we could require, again, a change in government, which all stems down to an economic indicator like GDP. Well, I think we need to be thinking much harder about what figures do we need about the economy for citizens to be able to hold their politicians to account. Yes. And if you look at it that way, which is the opposite way to the historical development of statistics. I mean, the word comes from state, and these were always numbers that were created to help states govern the country. But in a modern mass democracy, that's not the right way to think about it. And the statistics are public good and they're there for citizens to be able to hold to account people who claim positions of responsibility. You mentioned earlier the Doomsday Book. Was that you said it was an 11th century? Is this a philosophical treatise or treaties on? Oh, the Doomsday Book was um, when William the Conqueror conquered England and Wales. He sent around people to assess the assets held by everybody in the country, all the landowners. So their land and their houses and the number of sheep that they had to understand what the tax base was, how much tax he could raise and what he, he could use to reward his supporters. So it's, it's a um, an amazing national encyclopedia of, of assets of the, of the nation's wealth at uh, that time in the late 11th century. And there's the Netherlands being mentioned again indirectly. He's from, from originally from the Netherlands, is he? From from France. Oh, from France. Okay, yeah. I thought he, the old the old enmity. Okay, William. <laughs> okay, I thought it was William of Orange. William the Orange. William of Orange was, was much much later, but I'm going okay. back back much further than that to oh, William, okay. the, William the Conqueror, the other William the Conqueror. Oh, and okay, I, I'm not up on my UK history at all. Yes, and the Human Development Index, and there's also the Gross National Happiness Index as well, and they measure more than the economic indicator of productivity. They include a lot of subjective um, measures of happiness and well-being and so on. Do you find these equally as important or more important today than they have been in the past? Do you know, I actually find them less important. Right. The Human Development Index includes gross domestic product per capita and a number of other indicators such as life expectancy, literacy rates, access to clean water and technology and and so on. And so it's a very useful um, indicator for development economists to look at how countries are progressing compared to each other. But it doesn't give you a lot of extra information, particularly over time, compared to just looking at GDP. The thing about gross national happiness is that, well, I'm actually really sceptical about it, People's happiness adjusts very quickly, and there is a lot of um, research showing that if something happens to you that's marvellous, like winning the lottery, or terrible, like having a bad accident, then your level of happiness that you report changes for a bit, and then you're just back to where you were to start with. So if you ask on a nationwide level how happy people are, normally everybody says, oh, six or seven and it doesn't change very much over time. There's just not a lot of information in that. 
And I don't see any way why you would expect a psychological state like happiness or well-being or contentment to give you very much information about the public policies of any kind, including including economic policies. It's just it's just a different sort of number. And people say, well, we stop getting any happier as GDP continues to go up. And I don't find that surprising because GDP is an artificial idea and it can rise without limit. It could be 10 or it could be uh, 6.8 trillion. And happiness is a survey and people are asked to rank it between 0 and 10 or sometimes between 0 and 3. And it's never going to be at all related to to uh, what you're measuring that's happening in the economy. And I think using happiness is a kind of excuse for inactivity. If people living in Bangladesh say they're pretty happy anyway, why would you bother doing anything about it? Yes, that just reminds me of something I came across recently, actually. Oh, hysteresis, whereby yes. you you might be unemployed for a certain period of time yeah. and you experience that huge fall in income, but then you get readjust to your lifestyle in terms of, say, staying at home. And you find a point that's almost to go back to work because whether you're happy or not, what, staying at home outweighs the potential of going back to work and earning that slightly higher or higher income. That's, that's certainly part of it. Yeah, I, I know it's not in a way related, but it just triggered a thought there. Diane, your other book is quite interesting, The Soulful Science. But firstly, I want to ask you, why did you call it The Soulful Science? A lot of people call it The Dismal Science and uh, think that's a, a term of disparagement. Actually, the history of that term is quite honourable for economics. It was coined by the historian Thomas Carlyle, who objected to economists like John Stuart Mill at the time being opposed to slavery. On the Mill was opposed to it on the very obvious grounds that all human beings deserved equal respect and counted equally when you were thinking about what was happening in the economy or society. And Carlyle, who was a conservative historian and believed in property rights and uh, was OK with the idea that you could own other people, was objecting to economists taking part in the anti-slavery campaign. So he called it the dismal science. Actually, I think that's a badge of honour. But most people take it as a criticism of economics. So I wanted to point out, actually, how very human a science good economics is, that it is concerned about improving the well-being of people in the economic arena of society. And so the book looks at all the research at that time, all the most recent research in different areas of economics. Because a lot of critics say economics is just about money and economists all think it's all about markets and that's all that counts and markets are getting everywhere. Whereas actually that might have been true or a bit, a bit of a caricature, but more true around 1980 or 1985 at the height of Thatcherism and Reaganism. But for the past 20 years, economists have been looking at been looking at happiness, have been looking at what's called behavioural economics, which is bringing psychology and all the quirks about how humans take decisions into economic modelling, have been looking at the importance of political institutions for development and growth, have been paying more attention to using experimental methods in economics to get better evidence. So the subject now bears absolutely no resemblance to the caricature that many people have in mind when they criticise it. And you mentioned it's a badge of honour. Is that just because Thomas Carlyle had recognised the fact that we were becoming more soulful, as you mentioned, in terms of respecting human quality of life in the economy? He dis yes, he disapproved. He disapproved yeah. of of that equality of respect for people that's inherent in the individualism of economics. Okay, so we've moved on from, well, practically from mass slavery to an economy whereby we're transitioning. And really, I don't, I don't know if we know where exactly we're, at, we're going, especially with the <laughs> tumultuous period that we've experienced over the last seven, eight years. But there are many countries out there still experiencing high levels of poverty on, in relative terms, but also within developed economies, there are quite a disparity in terms of the levels of wealth or inequality that does exist. And how can we eliminate that now? I was talking to Darren Asimoglu recently, and he mentioned the fact that institutions could be the key to unlocking inequality between countries 
But do you agree with that or what is your own take on it? Is there more to that? Yeah, there, um, it's interesting the way that we've all become much more aware of inequality in the past couple of years. And of course, that famous Thomas Piketty book had a lot to do with that. But if you look at the data about when inequality increased, the big increase came in the 1980s and not more recently. In fact, in the past few years, there has, if anything, been a little bit of a reversal. And if you look at inequality between countries rather than within countries, actually, we've seen a really big period of much more equal incomes around the world because of the growth of um, the middle class in, in China in particular, but also to a degree in India and Latin America. So it's um, a bit of a more nuanced picture. And we should celebrate the fact that over the past couple of decades, we've seen the biggest fall in poverty in terms of numbers of people in recorded history. That's a good thing. If you look at the inequalities within the OECD countries as a whole or individually, I think there's also an institutional story there. Uh, it's partly about people on very low incomes in families where there's been a lot of unemployment for a very long time. And there you're talking about the really difficult problems of making the benefit system and the training system and education work to get people into jobs and also about the rules that make sure that the conditions of work are, are good enough and there's a minimum wage in place that people can afford to live on. So there's that set of issues at the lower end of the income scale. I think there's also a real set of issues about top incomes and the way that a sort of global plutocracy has been able to use globalization and the financial markets and executive salaries to enrich themselves. And I would really, really like to see some policies to tackle outrageous top incomes for executives and bankers, which they fundamentally do not deserve. And they only get away with because the regulatory and legal systems allow them to do it. So we need proper competition in banking. We need com company law that prohibits the kind of merry-go-round of people awarding themselves big big uh, pay increases in the boardroom. And those things could be done. There's just no political will to do them. Recalling some of the reports in the media back in 2009, there were reports of the reintroduction of bonuses and these young traders who are buying up swathes of agricultural land in the countryside in England. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it was almost grotesque in terms of what was happening at that particular point in time where people were losing their homes and some of these traders or bankers were being rewarded based on, and maybe it wasn't based on their mistakes over the last while, but who do we blame for the banking crisis or the financial crisis? Is it the consumers? Had we fallen into the trap? Do we blame the actual system, the, the banking system or the people behind that who are operating the trades and the derivatives that have pretty much failed the economy? It is grotesque. I think that's an absolutely appropriate word for it. And the financial markets will uh, get away with what they can until they're stopped by regulators. So it was obviously a very complex set of circumstances that paved the way for the crisis. But if I had to pin the blame on uh, one thing, I would say it was that philosophy of regulation, which said, go ahead, boys, uh, uh, you know, do, do what you can to, to make money, because so much of the financial sector is uh, a zero sum game. It's trading in which you only make a profit if somebody else makes a loss. And the person making the loss is usually the little guy, the small investor or the, the small creditor who's taken out a mortgage. And regulators should not permit the system to continue all the huge bonuses and i would I, I, the european legislation i don't think goes far enough i would i don't believe any individuals deserve the kind of bonuses that are paid in the city and they often this requires government action because they will say if we don't pay them the bonus they'll get poached away by another bank and they're good people mm. and that's true so it has to be at the level of uh, national governments and international cooperation that this merry-go-round is stopped. But it isn't benefiting society. There's no benefit for society in a lot of what happens in the financial markets. And actually, this goes back to our GDP conversation. The political weight of the finance sector exists because they are able to say to governments, but look, we contribute X percent of GDP. 
and so many jobs depend on it. The percentage in GDP of the finance sector has been revised up several times over the years. Every new redefinition has increased the size of the financial sector. And the current definition is absurd. The biggest contribution of the financial sector to UK GDP growth came in the final quarter of 2008, when the cash machines almost stopped working and we were four hours away from not being able to go and buy groceries at the supermarket. It's absolutely absurd. And the reason is that the definition now includes the extent of the risk that banks are taking as part of their contribution to the economy. And that's just mad. It encourages them to take the risks. And we all take risks. You take a risk when you choose what job you're going to do or where you're going to buy your house and how much the price might go up. And we don't count that as as, um, a contribution to the economy. It shouldn't be in there. I mentioned earlier the review of economic statistics underway in the UK now, and one of the interim conclusions is let's have a look at this definition again. It's really not appropriate. So if the financial markets are effectively over leveraged, because I'm sure they are in terms of the trillions of pounds that they are heavily invested in, whether it's mortgage backed securities or stocks and, you know, whatever other futures and options that might be invested in, Mm. would that, that's obviously falsifying. I wouldn't say falsifying, but that's obviously giving us a a false sense of a true measure of GDP for the UK. Uh, Do you know, I might even use the word falsifying. I think we get a false impression of how important the financial services sector is compared to other parts of the economy. And in terms of the leverage of the sector, I really don't understand why regulators think it's okay for banks to have so little equity capital and to decide for themselves, using their models of what risks they're taking, how much that ought to be, when any other business in any other sector of the economy, the shareholders and uh, the government would go bananas if they had so little capital in the business. It's massively over-leveraged. I liken it to Ireland back in 2006 and seven, where I think 33% of our GDP was coming from the construction sector. And I'm not sure what the weight was for the construction industry in Ireland, but I'm sure it was quite high. And with the implosion and our over-reliance of the construction sector, our economy obviously imploded Mm. uh, along with it. Do you worry about the UK economy, especially with the sense that David Cameron's government wants, not wants to, but they're going to put a referendum to the people in order to step aside from the European Union? Well, like uh, like many economists, I am... really concerned about the possibility of UK withdrawal from the EU. It's not just that it's our biggest trading partner, you know, as as a whole, and geographically we're part of we're part of Europe, so it seems crazy in that way. But it's things like, well, partly the consequences for inward investment. The UK has done very well out of inward investment because it's a business friendly, English language, good time zone place from which to do business in the rest of the EU, and that would go away, uh, possibly quite quickly. But also I think people um, people who argue for UK withdrawal underestimate the costs, that uncertainty, and the adjustment costs of leaving. Because we have been very much bound up in EU regulation, setting standards for products, setting legal frameworks and so on, for a very long time now. And it would be a huge disruption to the economy. And that uncertainty would would just halt investment for a long time, I think. I'm not sure about what the politics would be in terms in the UK, but could there be a possibility that if the UK left the EU, that Wales and Scotland could dissolve government or something or their relations with with England or from the UK and rejoin the EU? People, um, this is not my field of expertise, I'm not an expert on political polling, but people say the Scots would certainly want another independence referendum if that were the case. Right. And again, your book, uh, another book that you've written, Diane, if you don't mind me mentioning it and maybe discussing it briefly, if you'd like, is The Mm -hmm. Economics of Enough, How to Run the Economy as if the Future Matters. And I've had previous guests on the show who spoke about diverse topics in economics and Jason Shogren, who talked about endangered species and Joram Bauman on climate change and the need for attacks. And Loretta Napoleone, who talked about 
the race to the bottom in terms of prices. And Helena Norberg-Hodge, who also talked about the importance of localization and protecting indigenous communities. And you highlight in this book that there's a need for a sustainable economy of the future. Mm. And it almost brings all of these type of concepts together in one type of manifesto. What's your take on our, the consumers, ever increasing demands on products and services? And, you know, are, are we are we endangering the sustainability of our economy in the future or our planet? Writing The Economics of Enough was what set me thinking about how we measure the economy in the first place, because it is so geared to growth, to GDP growth, which is what happens in activity in a certain period, like a year, but not any of the long term consequences. And so there's a well known paradox that if you have a natural disaster, GDP goes up, not down, because we count the extra activity of rebuilding the roads and the bridges but we don't count the destruction of all the assets that took place in the first place. So one of the things that I would like us to measure and include in the political conversation is uh, something about assets. And I would define sustainability as uh, uh, really broadly, so not just natural environmental assets or biodiversity, but also public infrastructure, human capital, social sustainability, the whole, the whole framework. So you can bring into that questions like, is there so much inequality that a country is going to become ungovernable? You look at the United States and you think, well, maybe, yes, that can happen uh, because it's so polarised and and, um, and dysfunctional politically now. So all of those elements of sust- sustainability, I think, are important. And it seems to me that a lot of people are stepping back and asking that question partly because of the experience of the crisis and how long-lasting its after-effects have been, partly because of the focus on inequality and seeing all the, the bankers and executives buying up their mansions, as you were, as you were just mentioning. And um, I don't know, it seems to me a moment, uh, just a really uh, decisive political moment. And we have a choice between either the populism, the division, the extreme groups that we see on the rise in a number of countries reacting to everything that's been happening, or we find a better way of having that political conversation and having a stable middle class and having social and financial and environmental sustainability. And how can you have a stable middle class? Was that to sweeten them in terms of taxation or to meet the demands but I think I think it's it's a lot of it's a lot of, it's having a whole economic policy that is geared towards that kind of solid sustainable social order, and it's everything from addressing the, the excesses of boardroom pay, having a financial sector that isn't going to plunge you into crisis, having um, a, a labour market regulated so that it, there are uh, stable jobs but sufficient mobility as well, having an education system that is open to um, everybody and everybody has the opportunity to, to better themselves in life. And it's not just the people who happen to go to the right schools. So it's a whole array of policies. You have to have a sort of public philosophy uh, informing all of your policies across the waterfront that this is the kind of society you want and that sustainability in all these dimensions is what matters. Diane, I'm not sure how well known you may be in, in the mainstream in terms of the populace in the UK, but I'm sure that if they're aware of the writings that you're actually putting out there in terms of the books, and they, you'd be quite a hugely popular individual and mm. possibly someone they would like to see in cabinet. Oh, golly, don't wish that on me. It's the last thing I want to do. Is it? <laughs> I, I know you mentioned earlier on politics is not necessarily your field. No. But you obviously need an economist. And you said you worked in the, I, I mentioned at the beginning, you worked for the Treasury. Very, very briefly, at the start of my career, I worked for the Treasury. And um, I think it's really important for economists to talk to talk in a way that ordinary people can understand. And like any academic speciality, we have lots of jargon. It's made all the worse in the case of economics by using mathematics so much, which is a useful tool, and I'm not against it. But we have to talk to people as well, because it's not just that economics is a social science and that taxpayers pay for the work we do. It's also that economists are really influential in, in government and in, in, in political philosophy. So I've always tried to write for the widest possible audience. 
Now, books on economics, they're only rarely mass market. But I've been surprised with the GDP book at how much interest there's been in it, actually. And I've had invitations to talk to literary festivals and all kinds of places. And people are people are very interested in it. And so maybe I'm delusionally optimistic, but my sense is that there is an appetite for rethinking the way we understand the economy and, and what we want politicians to deliver for us. And you've won amazing awards as well for your book, GDP. Um, it's been very well received. I'm really, really pleased. And, um, well, I'll probably carry on writing about this kind of subject. And do you have anything else in the pipeline? I would like to write something. This is news to my publisher. Uh, I haven't shared it with them yet. I would like to write something about how we evaluate public policy. What do we mean when we talk about, in the jargon, social welfare or economic welfare? What do we mean in terms of well-being, looking at it in, in, in the economy? And I think it's all it's all been quite muddled. People are not really very clear about the principles they should be using to evaluate economic policies. And so I'd like to do something about that. And I think you'd be a fantastic person to do that because you're, you're really cut through the jargon, as you mentioned there. And, you know, not only would it be hugely popular, I'm sure, in terms of the mainstream, but also within academic circles, too. Well, I'm telling you that if you if you want a job uh, doing my marketing for me, you're very welcome. <laughs> Well, I'd love to have you back on the show in <laughs> once you have it published. Diane, can I ask you a number of quickfire questions? Go on. I would love to know what your favourite internet resource is, or do you have one? Twitter. Twitter. I know it's a quickfire question, but um, why, why is that the case in terms of networking? Because if you pick the right people to follow, it acts as a brilliant editor of all the interesting thing, information that you might be that you might want to know or you might be interested in. And it's like having a personalised uh, newspaper. True. On your blog, The Enlightenment Economist, you have a number of blog posts where you recommend and review books. Mm -hmm. What one or two books would you recommend to our listeners based on ones you've actually reviewed? There's a book about economics I like to recommend to um, everybody, which is called Reinventing the Bazaar by John Macmillan. And he is uh, now now dead, was a brilliant New Zealand economist who really thought about markets and why they worked and how they worked. And it's really, really well written. So I, I recommend that to all kinds of people. For anybody who's brand new to the subject, Tim Harford's books are absolutely excellent. He's got one called The Undercover Economist and one called, I think it's The Undercover Economist Revisited or something of the kind. And they're also absolutely excellent. Um, but we live in a time when actually there are loads of really good books being published about economics. And that's partly because of events being so interesting and people having so much to write about. Um, but there is just all kinds of good stuff. So I think people have to look at the blog. I'll definitely put the links up on that because there are fantastic reviews of many books out there, especially the ones that have been recently published that you've actually reviewed. And I'll put the links on my show notes to that. It'll be economicrockstar.com forward slash Diane Coyle. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now. And Diane... We mentioned a couple of economists at the throughout the, the show here, but who would your main influencers be? My main influence has, was my tutor, whose name is Peter Sinclair. He's now a professor at the University of Birmingham. And um, I went to university thinking I was going to become a philosopher and spend my life sitting in pavement cafes in Paris writing books and chatting. And it didn't mm -hmm. work out that way because he taught me to love economics so much. So he's been he's been a very big influence. And um, uh, my, my thesis advisor, Professor Ben Friedman at Harvard University, was another one. So they've been they've been personal influences. And I think I've been really lucky to have very wise, very soulful economists teaching me who turned me into the economist that I am today. Could I ask you about your PhD thesis? What was the main hypothesis or argument? I was looking at the way productivity changes over the business cycle and trying to understand why it didn't do what economists expected to do. So you'll be familiar with this. It's happening again now. It's not behaving as it should. And I looked at I looked at the data at the level of different industries and very quickly realised that actually every industry was completely different. And maybe it was a mistake 
to think about it in such an aggregate way. And in a way, thinking now about productivity, I've, I've come around full circle um, to, to that same issue. In my own master's, I wrote a thesis on the productivity differential effect, and I wrote about the Sam- Belasa Samuelson model, and I looked at Ireland, the UK, and Germany. And it was a very difficult thesis to work on because mm. the data was very, oh, it was painstaking, to be honest, because when I looked at other people in my class, they were doing a lot on finance where they could get the stock price data quite easily. Yeah. But having to find decades of consumer price indices and splice them, and then also to look at the intangibles and come up with proxy variables and then create weights and the continuous changing of weights for the consumer pricing index. It was it was a mind boggling experience. And this is pretty much where the Internet was only coming on stream and the data wasn't available on the Internet. And I had to look at many past journals or um, records on this and spend countless hours in the library trying to construct this index and but it will have made you a better economist than the people who did the theses using finance data True. and and i think actually having the internet has made it more dangerous because people doing their theses doing their research just download stuff and don't as you will have done understand that the stuff they're downloading is because somebody went to a library and spliced the series and made all kinds of judgments about it and maybe made some mistakes and unless you do it yourself you just don't know yeah, I recall a couple of times I'm coming to a, a kind of a very difficult situation where I just didn't know what was going to happen, whether it was going to succeed. And your mind is always ticking over mm. and you're so engrossed in trying to come up with a, a model or a proxy variable and almost having that eureka moment running up to my supervisor, knocking on the door and trying to blabber on and trying not making sense because it's all trying to come out all at once. You just want me to walk away and sit down and write it all down and come back when you're a little bit calmer. So um, that was quite enlightened, if you want to say a better word. Yeah, but there's nothing harder than writing a thesis. No, it's true, it's true. Diane, thank you so much for being so inspiring and for joining me on Economic Rockstar. I had a blast and I personally learned a lot from you. Share with our listeners where they can find you. The best way is on my website, enlightenmenteconomics.com and the blog that goes with it. You can find all the links to Diane on economicrockstar.com forward slash Diane Coyle. Diane, you are an economic rockstar. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you for inviting me on. Thank you very much. You too, Diane. Take care. Take care. All the best. Bye. 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 Bye.